If you are listening to this podcast, it means you're searching, searching for someone who understands you, someone who gets you. You are yearning to be understood and to belong. Welcome to the Someone Gets Me podcast, where we help smart, talented, and sensitive people navigate an often insensitive world. I am Diane Allen, your host. My roles as ambassador, author, speaker, and intuitive mentor for bright and talented people are woven into each episode. I have the experience and knowledge to educate and inspire as I have been there and I understand your unique intensities, sensitivities, and challenges. Welcome. How to Fill Your Cup, Nine Proven Ways. Hi, friends. I am here with you today to talk about filling your own cup. I often think about different things to talk about here on Someone Gets Me, focusing on, you know, gifted neurodivergent people, but also all people who are drawn to a life of expansion and moving forward in all kinds of interesting ways. And one of the things I notice with my clients is that filling their own cup seems to be an afterthought or an intermittent thought. Like I'll go do a weekend retreat or I'll go do this or I'll go do that, but it's not a consistent behavior often. So as a mentor, my role or one of them anyway, is to really support people in keeping these ways going on a regular, consistent basis, not only with accountability and support, but encouragement and new ideas. So these are the nine overarching ways to fill your own cup. Because if you're not filling your cup, the world and your responsibilities will keep draining the cup and you will end up dry like a desert. If you shut yourself down and say, well, I'm not going to do anything and I'm just going to, you know, be by myself and isolate, you create the Dead Sea. So it's really important to keep the flow going. And to realize that as neurodivergent, gifted people, or even intensely sensitive people, it's really easy to get distracted. We live in a world full of distractions that wants us to be distracted. Because if we're distracted and our cup is barely making it, we're running on E, we, we are susceptible to grief and fear, to believing things that aren't true. Our critical thinking and executive functioning suffers. So it's very important for all of us, I believe, to really pay attention to these things, to pay attention to, am I doing these things? And if I am, is it working? And if I'm not, what can I do to start filling my own cup? I mean, as I record this, we're in the middle of a holiday season and I keep hearing I'm drained, I'm tired, this is going on, that's happening. And then I think or sometimes say, so what are you doing for you? And I get one of those looks like, what? What are you doing for you in the middle of all that's happening? What are you doing in the middle of getting ready for a new year? You know, and it's funny, we have New Year's, but I kind of do my new year on my birthday, which is in November. But every day is the beginning of a new year. So what are you doing to allow yourself to fill your cup? So here are the nine ways that work together, sometimes in harmony, and they're definitely synergistic to help you keep your cup full. Moving forward, we want to keep our cup full so we are giving from the overflow so that all that we do to serve other people, the society in general, whether it's through our work or family or or our presence in general, that we're giving from the overflow so our cup remains full, even as we give. So the first thing I want to talk about today is rest. Now that means good quality sleep. So that means a good bed, a dark room that's a little cooler so that your body temperature, core temperature will drop, decreasing light noise, you know, not having screens in your face, you know, for at least the last hour before you retire, those kinds of things. And those are heavily researched and out there in the world that those are important. It saddens me to see people with televisions in their bedrooms that they're watching and they're on as they're going to sleep. That does not help you rest. You might say, well, I need that in order to go to sleep. And that's because your nervous system is dysregulated and there's a lot of work to be done to start to let your body actually physically rest. Then there's creative rest. 
And that's the kind of rest where you're working on a project or you're doing your life and you feel like you're running into a wall, writer's block, or I work with musicians and they have blocks. Well, sometimes when we distract ourselves, like go on a walk or take a shower or make a cup of coffee, the inspired ideas pop in. That's a form of creative rest. So every day, do you have creative rest where you come apart from what you're working on in your world and you do something a little bit different to allow the inspired ideas and all of the the other parts of you to come together with whatever it is you're looking for? I find that works for me a lot when it comes to my podcasting, to my writing, and to to my quilting and everything. When I give myself time away to do something different, really great ideas pop in. In fact, just recently, an episode, a couple episodes ago, I was going, I don't really know what to title this. I have some ideas, but I was really unsure about exactly what I wanted to talk about. And so I said, well, I'm not going to think about it now. I'm just going to go make some coffee. It was early in the morning. And I went out and I was making coffee and I barely, barely got started. And all of a sudden, boom, here's a title. This is a really good idea and put these ideas together. And so I came running into my office and wrote down everything that was, you know, coming to mind, all those inspired ideas. Then after I made the coffee, it was very easy for me to record the episode that had that content in it because I jumped on it when it came into my mind rather than pushing or forcing or trying to make it happen. So creative rest is really important and regular rest is extremely important, especially if you have any kind of neurodivergence. Rest is important and making excuses for why you're not giving yourself good rest is cheap. So let's let's not make excuses. Number two is movement and activity. We live in an in a increasingly sedentary society. And a lot of people, when I say do movement, they go, but I don't like the gym or I can't get to the gym. And I said, when did I say the word gym? Now you could go to the gym or you could go to a place and work out. Yes. But movement and activity is much more than that. A sedentary lifestyle um, creates microbiomes, you know, that make it harder for motivation. So it's like that inertia. You know, once you're sedentary, you stay sedentary. So we want to have activity and we want to have activity punctuated with rest. These two go together. So it can be anything from dancing to actually working out or even going for a walk or standing up every 15, 20 minutes while you're working and stretching and moving your body, twisting. There's so many things to keep you moving and active. And I, I laugh because when I was thinking about this a little earlier, I was thinking about, you know, when I was a child, there were no remote controls. We didn't, that wasn't a thing yet. So the kids were up changing the channels and, and we vacuumed our own houses and cleaned things. There weren't Roombas and things like that, that allegedly make life easier, but it takes away activity. So are you replacing your body's need for activity? Recently, I was down in Florida and, and sailed and raced a sailboat, which I've done my whole life and I haven't sailed in a long time. And so I went sailing and I looked at my watch that tracks my pulse. And the whole time I was on the water, everything was elevated. My body used up way more calories and any kind of sniffness in any of my muscles was gone. And that's because it got to move in a consistent, long manner. And that mattered. So there's lots of ways to get it, but it matters that you're moving and you have activity consistently throughout the day. Going on a walk on Saturday morning for 20 minutes is not good enough for the whole week. And going from your house to your car and back again, or to the kitchen, to the bedroom and back again, not enough activity. Your body needs to move. Number three is paying attention to one, the wonder of the universe, to the nature all around you. I was outside walking my dog the other day at 3.30 in the morning and the sky was clear and there was the Big Dipper right in front of me and the North Star. And I haven't even noticed it since I've been here, but it was right there. It was beautiful. I love watching the moon and the stars and flowers, of course, you know, my joyful moments. These things matter and they're important. So how are you connecting to nature? See, because we are part of nature. We are not separate from it. A lot of people think that we're like the observers. We control nature. We are above the laws of the universe. It's not true. 
We are part of the universe. We're an integral part of the universe, and we are bound by the same laws. That's the way it works. And so when we try to get around it or pretend like we're better than or bigger than, we harm the environment, we harm the other beings, we, and then also are harming ourselves. And so are you giving yourself permission to fill your cup by giving yourself time for wonder of the universe? Just today, I was out walking my dog and it's a little rainy and it was kind of like quiet. And I look up and this most beautiful hawk just went flying right by us. And then I started thinking, well, she's only 12 pounds. I wonder how much weight a hawk could pick up. I mean, I don't know. And I I wasn't afraid that the hawk was going to grab her, but I was curious. And so that's the wonder of the universe, right? Just paying attention, being curious. Scientists tend to be curious. We all have curious natures. And to allow ourselves to be connected to that and realize and remember that we are part of it. We are not separate from it. So when a human does something that damages Mother Earth or any of the sentient beings, we are in effect damaging ourselves because we're all connected. Everything's connected to everything. That's Einstein. He said that. He was a pretty smart dude. The fourth thing is to create. Every day to create something. Now, it's I'm not just talking about a sculpting and painting and music and writing. I'm talking about your creative energy. You create with your thinking. You create with your words. You create with the way you sit, the way you walk. You create when you smile at strangers in the store or when you scowl at them. You create when you passively judge somebody in your mind, even if you don't say it. You create when you offer goodness and glad tidings to others. You create when you have gratitude and compassion, and you create when you're angry and fearful. We are creative beings. We're always creating. So the better question is, what are you creating? Is what you're creating serving you for the better? Is what you're creating making your world and the world a better place? Is it a beneficial presence that you are creating? It's important that we're aware of these things. Because I think sometimes people walk around unaware that their mood, their energy, the way they operate and navigate and move through the world creates things. It's like a ripple effect. You know, a boat moving through the water creates weight. It creates ripples. You throw a stone into a calm lake, creates ripples. You walking through the world create ripples. So in addition to what you're physically creating, There is the creation of your presence. And what are you doing with it? If your cup is empty and you're you're stressed out and you're depleted, you're going to create a completely different world than when your cup is full and you're giving from the overflow. And so what I want to suggest here for especially intensely sensitive neurodivergent people is that we spend special time every day really paying attention to filling our own cup. The world is full of distractions. It's full of things to take our energy or that we can give our energy to. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you're not filling your own cup up, you're going to end up spent and tired. And then you go into overwhelm and shut down. Those things don't serve you. They harm your nervous system. They harm your digestion, your heart. Your body can't take it. So it matters that our cup is full and it matters that we have protected and dedicated time to keep our cup full. The next thing I want to talk about is being open to new experiences. And that means open-mindedness, but also open-heartedness. It means having the lid off your cup every once in a while so the water can get in, so to speak. I watched somebody have one of those big travel cups with a lid on it. And then he opened up the top of it that just had the little sippy part. Okay. Now the big cup had a whole lid except the little sippy part. And he was put dripping water into the top of it in order to fill it up to wash it. You could do that. Keep the lid on your cup and only let a little bit in at a time. And it would take a long time to fill your cup. Or 
You can keep the lid off. You can be open at periods of time, let in lots of yummy goodness, let the universe and other people nurture you, allow yourself to experience expansive things. And then you can lovingly put the lid back on so that it doesn't spill out, right? All kinds of metaphors for that. But I think it's important that we're open, that we are open to our bright ideas. We're open to our own inspired thoughts. We are open to connecting with people or being in a a place and situation where we can be a beneficial presence by either receiving service or giving service. I think it matters that we're open. When we close our minds and we close our hearts, we tend to sink like a rock. That's not the goal. At least I don't think that's your goal. The next thing is to have quiet time alone. And even for extroverts, right? Quiet time alone is really kind of fun because what I notice is when I say that to people, they go, well, I can't do that. It's stressful for me to be alone. If you're saying that to yourself, I'm telling you here that you are addicted to being busy and distracted because addiction is far more than what substance you put in your body. Addiction can be to neurochemicals and to patterns. So if you're so busy and so distracted that being alone for a few minutes and going within just breathing is stressful for you, then let's talk. There's a better way. If when you're feeling peaceful and alone, you feel bored, again, that's an addiction to stress. We need to talk. Your body, your neurology, your physiology, your mind all works much better when there is a balance between activity and rest and quiet and engagement. These things matter. And Quiet time is essential. Like some people might meditate or some people might ponder. Some people I know draw a little bit, just kind of play. Other people just sit and breathe. But the quiet time matters. The quiet time that I take a lot early in the morning out where there's no movement around other than nature herself is beautiful. And sometimes I take quiet time um, at the seashore where I'm at the Gulf and listening to the waves and the birds. And sometimes my quiet time is sitting in my living room, looking at my fireplace or outside with a fire pit. There's no wrong answer. The bigger question is, again, are you doing it? Do you take quiet time for you every day? I'm working with this couple right now. And one of the situations is that when they both get home from work, which is roughly within about 30 minutes of each other, One of them needs decompression time, like let them go in another room and read or be quiet for a minute and then join the rest of the family for dinner and things and conversation and talking about the day. They're a little bit more introverted. They need that little internal process time. The other partner is much more extroverted and wants to do the blow by blow. Let's talk about everything right away. Walk in the door which almost feels energetically assaultive to the person who's introverted. Now, it's not an assault in a negative way. It's just a lot. So everybody processes their day differently. Everybody needs their quiet time differently. So when you're in relation with another person, it's important to identify these things. But first, you need to know how it is you do it so that everybody can honor that. So when I taught them how to have a little pattern where one person goes, and does their quiet time first, and the other person does their quiet time later at a different time, suddenly there's not as much push and pull and there's not as much discord because both people stepped out of their own way of seeing things and were able to begin to see the needs of the person they love. Quiet time alone is essential for all of us. How and when you do it and and in what ways are unique to each one of us. And it can change over time, which I think is really, really good. The next thing I want to talk about is connection. And if you've listened to me for any period of time, you've heard my phrase, connection is the correction, because I believe that. There's three different kinds of connection that I focus on um, with myself and people I work with. One is connection with ourselves. 
so many people are running from themselves. They're not really, really in them, in their own body, in their own mind, they're running. In fact, I was a clinical director of a fairly large treatment center years ago, and a couple of the counselors were always running from themselves. Whenever we were talking or having a conversation, or even in the group therapy situation when it would get intense, the counselors would run and distract. And that's because they're not, they weren't comfortable in their own skin at that time. I hope that they've, they've grown through that these many years later, but it matters that we are comfortable in our own skin and can stand in our authority, right? It matters that we're connected to ourselves. We know what our needs are. We know what's important to us. And we stay in integrity with that. It matters that we don't compromise who we say we are on that inner, that inner way. And then there's a connection with others. Not only other humans, but other beings, right? Um, are we connected to others? And how do we do that? How do we discern? How do we use our, our boundaries, our inner boundaries, our outer boundaries, our energetic boundaries? How do we do all that? And for each one of us, it's a little different. So when I'm working with people doing these things, it's all unique situations. And so we go through and we say, okay, for you, this is how it works. Knowing that as we grow and change and evolve, there will be a fluid movement and changes in some of these things. I think the word boundary gets a bad rap. It gets like a big wall that goes up. Well, maybe you have to put a wall up for some things, but your really boundaries are the set of rules you use to allow people in. And so it's not a bad word and it's not all rigid. It's not all black and white and it's very fluid. And so we want to have our own inner awareness, our own inner connection so that as we engage with others individually or collectively, we stay in our own integrity. And then, of course, connection with the greater universe, which goes right with the wonder of nature, but it's all of it. It's our spiritual inspiration. It's our inspired ideas. Because for me, spirituality is our connection to who we are and our role here in this world as part of the greater. It has, it's, it's separate and independent from religion things. It's about, okay, well, we're sucking air, so what's our role here? We have a right to be here like all animals, but we're not above the system. We're in the system. So what is it that we are here to do? And how are we connected to that greater universe, the inspiration that comes through us that is meant to create something beautiful? You can already see how these all go together, right? They feed each other. I love the synergy of it. And then, of course, number eight is nourishment. How are you nourishing yourself? Now that comes in the way of food, right? Food that comes through a window probably isn't real nourishing. Some of it might be. Are you aware of what you're putting in your body and how your body likes it? If your body does not like a certain kind of food, like dairy or gluten or whatever, don't eat it. We live in a society that says, here, take a pill, eat it anyway and take a pill. So what if you listen to your digestion and what if you took care of your microbiome? And what if you honored it, knowing things change and shift over time? What if you did that? What if instead of abusing yourself by eating things you know that are bad for you, you loved yourself a little more? And it had, doesn't have to be an all or none at all. I had a client a while ago that had had surgery in, in her intestines for um, some kind of gluten situation. Um, it was before I started working with her, so I'm not 100% sure how it all happened. But it was serious surgery and she was told not to eat gluten and she wasn't eating gluten and some time had gone by. And in, our, in the course of our work, she decided to um, start looking for work again because she was feeling strong enough and, and comp, you know, felt confidence back. So she went and uh, interviewed and got a job. And then in between going to the interview and I guess she got hired on the spot and driving to my office for our session, she stopped at a local store and got two sandwiches, two Cuban sandwiches on big Cuban bread and brings them in so that they, you know, cause we're in Florida so that it wouldn't get ruined in the car. And I said, I have two Cuban sandwiches. I'm going to have one when we're done and one later for dinner. And I just looked at her. And I was kind of curious and it kind of fell out of my mouth, you know, like, so you're not supposed to eat gluten, but you're getting these sandwiches to celebrate. Like how I don't understand. You're poisoning yourself to celebrate something good. And she had, didn't even think of that. 
And she looked at me like, what? And she was a little mad at first. And then she was like, oh my God, you're right. You're right. I'm about to eat something because she loves Cuban sandwiches to celebrate, but yet it was going to harm her. Now, I don't know if she ate those sandwiches after she left or not. She never did tell me. But do you see how we live in a world that's distracting and does not always help us see what's good for us? So sometimes as a mentor, I get to you know say things maybe that, that are a little bit um, surprising to some people, like, but this is what I see. And that doesn't mean I'm right or wrong or you're right or wrong. It just means let's have other perspective. Let's allow other energy for that connection with others to evolve each one of us into the ways that we're meant to be, to expand more fully into our own sovereignty here on earth. Now, the other kind of nourishment is that I love, to, I love, 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 is gourmet conversation. And that's the kind of conversation where time practically stands still when you're talking to somebody. You put two sailors together after a race, and they'll go on and on and on. That's gourmet conversation. Or two scientists talking about some geeky, cool thing at a conference that most other people wouldn't even know what they were talking about, but they know, and it's amazing. Or you get a couple of musicians together and they're songwriting and they're, and they're really working on things. And you pretty soon you start seeing the beauty of not only the conversation through music and the conversation through their instruments and the conversation humanly, something beautiful happens. Right. And then there's um, when people are jamming, you know, and they're, they're just free flow playing their instruments and guess what happens? There is a conversation happening. So gourmet conversation happens in lots of ways. It happens with eye contact. It happens with smiles and affect. And so for me, part of nourishment is gourmet conversation, allowing myself to engage in those deeper, richer, more fulfilling conversations, whether it's regarding the topic doesn't matter. The connection is what matters. Like I have some friends and, and I've been quilting for a while, but they've been quilting much longer. And we talk about it sometimes, and it's fun to talk about. It's gourmet conversation. Or sometimes I'll go out for a meal with a friend, and we'll just get into great conversation about all kinds of topics. But when we step away from the table, we feel fulfilled. That's how you can tell it's gourmet, right? You feel full in all the right ways. And the ninth thing is taking time to reflect and ponder. And I think so often we're in this world that's move, 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 go, 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 like we're machines. Well, what if we stopped every once in a while and reflected? And the decisions I've made in the last day, week, or whatever, have they served me? Are there things I did that I would like to change? Or maybe there were things I didn't do that I wanted to do that, hold on a minute here, what undermined that? Or maybe just pondering our role in the world or what we want to do next. You know, we're coming up to a new year's and that kind of reflection often happens. And then pondering where we're headed or what we would like to see because we create things in our reflection and in our thinking. So it's important to honor that in yourself. And so as you can see with these nine things, there's a lot of synergy. And synergy means it all multiplies as the energy, right? So as gifted, intensely sensitive people, we are experiencing all nine of these things in a nuanced way on multiple levels. If you have ADHD or a twice exceptionality and your executive functioning is, is different than the common, then it takes a little bit more effort to connect with yourself, make friends with you, Realize there's nothing wrong with you because you're built a little different doesn't mean it's pathological. It just means it's time to find a new and different way to function if there's any rub, meaning you don't feel full joy. And so for all of us, we're navigating the rapids of life sometimes. There's lots of distractions. There's lots of mixed messages. There are lots of people telling us, oh, you're wonderful because you're, you're smart and talented. And other people saying, oh, my God, it's really hard. Well, I think the answer is yes to all of that. There's a very big dark side to being an intensely sensitive, empathic person. There's a dark side to being smarter than the average bearer, really creative. But there's also 
something magical. So I think when we focus on allowing all these ways to keep our cup full, we can give from the overflow, but it also allows us to stand in our sovereignty with who we really are. It allows us to have good discernment, to know what's true and what isn't true really. It allows us to be able to walk through this world and not be deceived by weird energy or deceptions because we can see. When our cup is nearly empty and we're running on fumes, seeing deception and being um, impacted by fear and upset and greed and all those things is a lot more difficult. We get more, much more susceptible to it. And so I always like to take time and ponder things. You know, I see it in, in the business world where people have undisclosed motives and sometimes disclosed motives, but sometimes what happens is they, their cups aren't full. And so the person trying to sell the person or the person trying to buy the thing or whatever, roll the person in, it gets all staticky. And there's, there's often a lack of integrity and lack of connection. And sometimes it's because there's an undisclosed motive that's not so pretty, but sometimes it's because everybody's spent and tired and not fully in their body and not having made friends with themselves and not caring for themselves. We live in a society that has taught people, particularly women, to put everybody else first. But as the old proverbial, you know, oxygen mask on the airplane, you have to save yourself before you can save anyone else. And I know there's those of you going, I know, I know, I know, I have to love myself first. And you make an excuse and kick it off and still go about the way you were being. That's not serving you. Making excuses for unacceptable behavior in yourself or others doesn't help anyone. It doesn't serve the world. It doesn't serve you. So the, it's kind of like the buck stops here, right? Like, what are we doing for ourselves? And some days you're going to do this great. You're going to knock it out of the park. And other days, not so much. It's okay. There are some days that I practice all nine of these things. And I'm like, yeah. And I wake up the next day just full of um, all kinds of kind of shenanigans. And there's other days where I get a little bit behind or I get distracted or maybe lots of things happen and it's hard to, to come out of the overwhelm. And so we have to be loving with ourselves and compassionate and work with ourselves. I have many of my clients that, you know, I work relationally so that they can call when they need to. It's, oh, I only don't see them during our meeting times. And so sometimes it's just, wow, it's been a really hard day and I'm feeling really spent. And so what they're really saying is, Diane, hey, be a jumper cable and infuse a little extra energy in here so that I can charge my own batteries. And of course, I'm happy to do that because sometimes we need that little jumper cable. Sometimes we need somebody that we know without, or without any doubt is in our corner and is there to help us be the best us to like show up in the way we want to show up in the world. And so I have the best work in the world. I don't even consider it work. It's my vocation. It's what I'm called to do, but it's just the most glorious thing to see people smile and radiate in their own sovereignty as they shed all that doubt and distraction and gookiness. So if you're one of those people, start filling your own cup first. Make it so that that lid is off while you're filling it in and then and put that travel lid on so that you don't spill out and you can give out as you want to. So you want to rest and have creative rest. You want to move, have activity in your life. Now, we all know that variety and novelty is really good for people who are twice exceptional. So change it up. Different kinds of movement, different kinds of activity, different kinds of rest. Allow yourself to experience the wonder of nature and the universe. Be sure you're paying attention to what you're creating. Be open-minded and open-hearted as you cruise through life. Make sure every day you get some time alone to be quiet inside. Connect yourself with yourself. Allow connection with others. Allow connection with the greater universe. Nourish yourself with yummy, good, high nutrition food and gourmet conversation. And always remember to reflect on your previous day and move forward, pondering what great things you can create moving forward. So hope, friends, that these nine things and as they come together and work together 
will serve you in filling your own cup so that you can be everything your heart desires. So that when you look at your life at any juncture, you begin to say, yeah, yes. You can nod your head and you can know that you're in a flow that's meant for you. No two of us have the same mission. No two of us do it the same. Everyone is a bit different. That's the beauty of the world. Just like our fingerprints, the way we operate has nuance and beauty and depth. So allow yourself to be you, be uniquely you, even in the way you rest and create and engage with the world. I hope this has served you, friends. I wish you well. Remember to put your face to the sun so the shadows fall behind you because you're a rock star. You are here on purpose with a mighty purpose. So go out there and let your light shine. Until the next episode of Someone Gets Me, be well. Are you tired of searching for someone to understand you? Join our Facebook group, Someone Gets Me. In this group, you will be able to connect with others who are intense, sensitive, smart, and talented. I share my insights and teachings, and you can connect with others in a real, authentic, safe forum. So join us today. Someone gets me.